And welcome to Berkeley's Global Connection Series Masterclass titled The Significance of Today's K-Pop Industry. My name is Tim Lee, and I'm the Associate Director of International Recruitment, overseeing global recruitment work at the college. Uh, 안녕하세요. 오늘 버클리, 버클리 교수진이 말하는 K-POP의 현주소라는 제목으로 진행되는 글로벌 커넥션 시리즈 마스터 클래스에 참여하신 여러분들 환영합니다. 방금 보신 공연 여, 영상은 버클리 재학생 및 졸업생들이 커버한 K-POP 퍼포먼스였습니다. 제 이름은 팀 리라고 하고요. 저는 버클리 음대에서 국제학생 유치 업무를 총괄하고 있습니다. Today's event is sponsored by our Berkeley Global Partner, CJ Culture Foundation. Who has been instrumental in being a generous donor and a partner in support of Korean students studying at Berkeley for more than a decade? 오늘 master class는 지난 10여 년간 Berkeley를 진학하는 재능 있는 한국 학생들에게 장학금을 지원함과 더불어 음악인으로서 꿈을 이룰 수 있도록 지속적인 도움을 주고 있는 Berkeley 음대 글로벌 파트너인 CJ 문화재단의 후원으로 진행됩니다. Berkeley faculty Heju Kim and Jonathan Perkins will be sharing their experience and perspective on K-pop music industry today. Um, Heju Kim is an assistant chair of professional music with an expertise in K-pop culture and music industry. And Mr. Perkins is assistant chair of songwriting department who has worked with Grammy winning artists and K-pop acts alike. Professional Music Hakwae Puakwajang Nimishin, Kimajigus Ningwa, Song Noiding, Puhakwajing, Puhakwajang Nimishin, Jonathan Perkins Gus Nimkeso, Owner Master Class Retoyo, Pokuligus in a Quancha Mesoponun, K Pops Hanabedean, Hesok, Midoro, Kyongam Damdur, Nano Jistoro, Hagasimida. There will be a QA session at the end of the event, so please feel free to send us questions via chat window. Uh, presentation is not where, Chilmunul Panishigani is in. Chat window로 질문을 보내주시기 바랍니다. Without further ado, uh, here's Heju Kim to kick off the presentation. 먼저 김혜주 교수님께서 진행하시도록 하겠습니다. Thank you, Mr. Tim Lee. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, Just bear with me here. Okay, so I think we're in business, right? Okay, all right. Okay, so um, thank you and hello from Boston, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, the rise and growth of Korean pop culture around the world in recent years has been tremendous with K-pop receiving particular attention recently. In today's session, I'd like to take a look at K-pop's wide reach and some of the marks that it's made along the way before briefly introducing the professional music department at Berkeley. When K-pop started out more than 20 years ago, culture critics and analysts thought that it would be a passing fad. Many were skeptical, thinking that it was just a Korean thing or an Asian thing with limited appeal and that, would, that it would probably disappear as maybe a footnote in world music. But as I talk to you today, BTS and Blackpink are among the hottest music groups around the world, and it's very clear that K-pop has become a global phenomenon. With over 20 years of history now, and many notable achievements, K-pop has gained wide recognition to the extent that people no longer ask the question, what is K-pop? I do still, however, hear the question, why K-pop? As it moves from awareness to acknowledgement and on to broader acceptance. Why is K-pop so popular? What makes it stand out? And how does it keep attracting global audiences? So I wanna take a moment to revisit some aspects that distinguish K-pop and that have continued, uh, that, ha that have contributed to its popularity. K-pop is of course very visual. It often comes with slick choreography or a signature dance moves that you can imitate. This makes it perfect for visual platforms like YouTube. In fact, K-pop songs don't just come with the music video, the songs are the music video. In terms of the music itself, K-pop is often very catchy and thus accessible to a wide audience. <clears throat> it also invokes a range of music genres, from rock to rap to pop to EDM, R&B, disco, and so on. K-pop is multi-genre, sometimes even in one song. 
And in this sense, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, actually difficult to pin K-pop itself as, as a genre. And K-pop is really a whole package. The music is good, but it's beyond just music. It's music, dance, choreography, fashion, storytelling, a multifaceted art form that gives you a comprehensive experience. And because of its highly visual nature and consistently high production value, it thrives on the internet. And perhaps most importantly, K-pop is participatory. It really is driven by the fandom. And I think this is one of the very special aspects of its culture. <clears throat> Fans can participate on many levels beyond simply listening to the music or following a song's dance moves. K-pop artists are highly active on social media and this has been crucial to their popularity as this interaction reduces the barrier between art artists and audience, essentially nurturing relationships rather than marketing to fans in any one directional fashion. These are some of the characteristics that have propelled K-pop to increasing visibility, awareness and recognition in the global pop music arena. They speak to creativity, incredibly hard work and consistently high production standards, as well as evolution of technology. While there are many K-pop groups enjoying immense popularity at the moment, two of the biggest are Blackpink and BTS. So I will review just a few of their achievements, starting with Blackpink, who debuted in 2016. Since their debut, Blackpink has quickly joined the Billion Views Club. Currently, at least three of their hits have over 1 billion views on YouTube. That's 1 billion. Blackpink also recently held the Guinness World Record for the most views within 24 hours on YouTube with their song, How You Like That, which generated over 86 million hits within a day of its release. This record was broken by another K-pop group, BTS, this summer. Blackpink was also the first K-pop girl group to play Coachella last year, one of the biggest music festivals in the world. And they've also performed on several mainstream American television programs, including Jimmy Kimmel Live, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and Good Morning America. Now on to BTS. Here's a quick review of the reach that BTS has had in the American mainstream. BTS has been on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon more than once. They were guests in 2018 and again this year, twice this year, once before the pandemic, and more recently this fall, just last month, for a one week long residency, of course, remotely. And that's Jimmy, uh, that's the group and Jimmy Fallon at Grand Central Station in New York, where they filmed earlier this year before the pandemic. Last year, BTS performed on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. The show takes place in the theater where the Beatles famously made their American debut in 1964. BTS is often compared to the Beatles in their popularity and worldwide fandom. And here you see the comparison and the homage paid to the Beatles with BTS in suits and in black and white. In 2017, they were on Jimmy Kimmel Live as well, another very popular mainstream program. BTS performed on Saturday Night Live in 2019. They were on Carpool Karaoke with James Corden in 2020, this year, just before the pandemic. And they were invited on The Ellen Show twice, once in 2017 and again in 2018. BTS was the first Korean act to perform at the Grammys earlier this year with Lil Nas X here performing Old Town Road. They were the first K-pop act to present at the Grammys in 2019. And there is much talk and anticipation about their Grammy prospects for the coming year. And here they are, here they are performing with Charlie Puth, who is actually a graduate of Berkeley. BTS has filled incredibly large stadiums. This is their concert at the Rose Bowl last year, a stadium with a capacity of 90,000 seats. This concert was sold out. And their concert at the iconic Wembley Stadium in London also last year. BTS was the first Korean band to perform at Wembley Stadium. This concert also sold out in 90 minutes. Currently, BTS is not only the hottest K-pop group in the world, they are arguably the hottest pop act in the world. Since forming in 2013, BTS has amassed an incredible following and continues to break new ground as it breaks new records. They've charted on the Billboard 200 chart four times thus far, and they're the first group since the Beatles to have three number one albums on this chart in less than a year. 
They've won the favorite, the favorite Social Artist Award at the American Music Awards in 2018, beating out artists like Cardi B, Ariana Grande, Demi Lovato, Shawn Mendes. And they've also won the Top Social Artist Award at the Billboard Music Awards for the past four years. BTS holds the record for the most YouTube views within a 24 hour period, breaking Blackpink's record this summer with the song Dynamite, which, has, which gained over 100 million views within 24 hours of its release. And they've been invited to speak at the United Nations General Assembly twice, once in 2018 and again this year. Their music carries a positive message of self-love and of embracing yourself and your identity, which has resonated with people of all walks and ages all across the globe. And you see here that they were featured on the cover of Time Magazine in 2018. BTS has about 20 million followers on Twitter and they hold the Guinness World Record for most Twitter engagement. To give you an idea of this activity, this is a map created by Nicole Santero, who is currently conducting research on BTS fandom for her PhD. The map shows the BTS uh, related Twitter activity in March of this year when they released their music video for Black Swan. And as you can see, the fandom is really very global. It's spread out across the map, not concentrated in one geographical area. The BTS fans called ARMY really reflect a diverse cross-section of race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, and age. And I'd like to animate this map just one more time uh, as I tell you to look for that one dot up at the bottom of the map in Antarctica. It's there uh, and I'll animate it just one more time. Right there. <laughs> so there you have it in Antarctica. This map shows the Twitter activity around the Match a Million campaign in June of this year, after BTS donated $1 million to the Black Lives Matter movement. Within a day, BTS fans matched that amount to donate $1 million of their own to Black Lives Matter. But of all their achievements, Charting number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart is one of their most significant, as this chart is an important indicator of mainstream popularity. BTS made history when Dynamite took number one on the Hot 100 chart. They are the first Korean artist to do so. The song, released in August, enjoyed seven straight weeks on the Hot 100 chart, including three times at the number one spot. At this point, I'd like to recall another famous Korean pop hit that we all know, Gangnam Style. When Sai's Gangnam Style came out in 2012, a lot of people thought that the song would hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. The song went viral and made history as the first video to surpass the 1 billion mark on YouTube. It had a huge cultural impact. It generated, generated endless cover versions and was referenced in all corners, <coughs> excuse me, of the media. Gangnam Style did chart on the Billboard Hot 100, but at the height of its popularity, it only went up to number two. This left some people puzzled and some frustrated as to why it did not reach number one, because the song was clearly so popular. It had the most YouTube views, the most downloads, and the best numbers in other categories as well. But the song was missing one crucial element and that was radio airplay. Charting on the Billboard Hot 100 at the time was based not only on sales, but also, and significantly, on radio airplay. That was a problem for Sai because as viral as Gangnam Style was on YouTube, it did not get enough radio play. Mainstream American radio stations just did not play it as much as other songs that were popular at the time. So although Gangnam Style topped several other charts, the social chart, download chart, sales chart, it did not hit number one, on the Hot 100 chart because it lacked the radio numbers. And largely due to this situation, Billboard reconsidered their methodology and decided to give a heavier weight to digital sales and also began to include YouTube views in their calculations. 2013 then was the year that streaming officially became unignorable. Currently, the formula for charting on the Hot 100 includes radio airplay, sales, and streaming. So the popularity of Gangnam Style had an impact on the reformulation of metrics for the Billboard Hot 100 chart. This paved the way for 
for other musical artists that followed, artists that use YouTube heavily, including other K-pop acts. <clears throat> and it paved the way for a group like BTS to reach number one. While something like the reformulation of chart metrics points to a practical impact, on the American side, there's also been an increasing openness to diversity in the pop culture landscape in recent years. And in this sense, the awareness and growing acceptance of K-pop is also met with good timing. As a quick example, I point to the Korean film Parasite from 2019. Parasite is the first non-English language film to win an Academy Award for Best Picture, among others. Director Bong Joon-ho famously remarked at one of the award ceremonies this year that, quote, once you overcome the one inch tall barrier of subtitles, you will be introduced to so many more amazing films, end quote. He challenged the American public, which generally does not like reading subtitles for foreign films, to go beyond that small barrier. And Parasite made history this year, winning the several Oscars that it did. I draw on Parasite's success because I think that it and the increasing visibility of K-pop in the American market intersects with the current climate of diversity in the US, apart from the fact that it really is an excellent film worthy of the award. While the conversation surrounding diversity has always been important in this country, it's grown more significant in recent years with particular intensity this year, whether at colleges, universities, and academic societies that are reconsidering curriculum and programming or in professional associations, institutions, and organizations. It speaks to changing demographics and the evolution of tastes, as well as a sharpening awareness of bias and exclusion. In a sense, the American market is more ready to welcome and acknowledge Korean and other non-Euro-American offerings than it was just 10 or 15 years ago. Such a climate facilitates the continuing advance of K-pop in the American market and a win like Parasites at the Academy Awards or a smaller scale achievement like BTS charting number one on the Billboard Hot 100 signal both quality of product and an increasing diversity in the mainstream American market. As K-pop continues to make a mark in the American industry, we also began to see more collaborations. American artists who have worked with K-pop groups thus far include Halsey, Nicki Minaj, Ed Sheeran, Diplo, Steve Aoki, Sia, Jason Derulo, Becky G, Selena Gomez, and Lady Gaga, just to name a few. And others have expressed interest in working with K-pop artists, including Shawn Mendes, Tinashe, and even Dolly Parton. Partnerships are also growing. Last year in 2019, SM Entertainment debuted Super M, a group formed with members from some of K-pop's most popular groups, including EXO, SHINee, NC127, and WAVY, in partnership with Capital Music Group here in Hollywood. The group has been immensely popular and has already charted number one on the Billboard 200 chart with the largest debut sales by a K-pop act. The usual pillars surrounding the professional community also continue to grow with regular media coverage on various media platforms um, and channels from trade magazines to mainstream media outlets. Developments in K-pop and K-pop related stories are frequently covered in Billboard, Rolling Stone, Forbes, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, NPR, CNN, BBC, Complex, Vox, Vulture, and so on. And there are now reporters who are known as quote unquote K-pop journalists. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, K-pop advances in making a mark with innovative technology and design. Expanding beyond high quality content, it now draws attention to the delivery of this content. K-pop agencies were already developing and experimenting with augmented reality and virtual reality to enhance the musical experience well before COVID hit and changed the world. So if K-pop as a culture was not exactly prepared to deal with the pandemic, it was at least very well positioned. During the COVID era, while most musicians around the world had to stop all activity, Big Hit Entertainment and SM Entertainment have 
have produced live streaming concerts with great success, showing not only the possibility of holding concert activity in this restricted environment, but also showing its rich potential for new and alternative experiences. <clears throat> and once the world is past the pandemic, these te technologically enhanced concert experiences will likely stay, not to replace live performances, of course, but as a complement to them. And as a leader in this area, the case of K-pop can serve as a model that influences other music industries around the globe. In these ways, K-pop and Korean pop music broadly continues to impact the global pop music community as it makes its mark on the American and the larger music industries. As such, it is writing, or at least informing, a new chapter in the history of American pop music. And if I may just take a moment here to um, talk personally, I will say that it's been a special thrill to see these exciting developments in Korean music in recent years. When I came to the United States in the 1970s, there was practically no Asian representation in popular music or pop culture. Uh, maybe there were some Western classical musicians, but practically nothing visibly in the mainstream American media. Uh, so to see rich talent coming out of Korea and dynamic music and content coming from these artists is both fascinating and gratifying. And we are eager to welcome talented students from Korea here at Berkeley, who will take us into the next chapter of Korean music. So I'll spend my last few minutes saying a few words about Berkeley and about my department. As a leading institution of contemporary music, Berkeley embraces diversity on many levels. For one, it celebrates a diverse range of musical genres. I think of the multi-genre of K-pop and how Berkeley is really an ideal place in this regard, where students are exposed to and trained in many diverse styles of music. Also, and importantly, Berkeley is a global and outward facing school. About one third of our student population are international students and Berkeley graduates work in music industries across all corners of the globe, including Korea. And with that, here's just a short list of some Korean musicians who have come through Berkeley in the past. Saxophonist uh, and big band leader, Jung Sung Jo, who is uh, one of the first Koreans to enroll at Berkeley back in the 1970s. <clears throat> Composer and singer-songwriter Kim dong yu Singer and lovely vocalist Chang Ye-jin. And the famous and extraordinary Psy, of course. The singer Yang Pa. We have the rocker and musical theater artist Samun Tak. Of course, Pak Po from 21, composer and producer Yun Sang, and of course, Kenzie, one of SM Entertainment's secret weapons. Kenzie has written songs for Boa, Kangta, Girls' Generation, Super Junior, FX, EXO, uh, among others. Okay. So I'd like to introduce just a bit about the professional music department or the pro music as we call it uh, at Berkeley. So what is the pro music major? The pro music major is designed to provide students with the opportunity to choose their own path of study while also developing the practical skills needed for a career in music. So simply put, it's a course of study that allows flexibility in choosing your own academic path. And with an understanding that music professionals need to be skilled in both the artistic and the administrative and business aspects in today's music industry, it focuses on entrepreneurship while encouraging creativity. And one final point, pro music is one of the most popular majors at Berkeley. Uh, and additionally, many of Berkeley's award-winning graduates uh, of Emmys and Grammys uh, are pro music alumni. 
So what will I study in pro music? Uh, the three bullets on the bottom reflect the, cur the curriculum shared across the college. So uh, the core music, liberal arts and general electives, these are um, uh, the curricula that, uh, that, that the departments share. Um, the two bold bullets at the top are specific to pro the pro music course of study, uh, which includes performing, music business, production, and marketing, among others. And the second bullet, where it says concentration. This is what makes pro music unique. In addition to the pro music core courses, students can choose up to three areas of concentration that they want to study. So please don't be alarmed. I will not read everything on this slide. Uh, this is just to give you a glimpse of the concentrations that you can take as a pro music major. This is a partial list. And if you're interested in taking a closer look, at these concentrations, you can find them on the pro music page, the department page on the Berkeley website. Um, but as you can see, just from a quick glimpse, there's composition, there's music history, private studio teaching, performance. Um, so there are a lot of options. So in general, what pro music offers? It offers flexibility and structure while letting you explore varied interests. It also offers an applied understanding of the music industry. And overall, it supports your individualized preferences, allowing you to define your path as a musician. And so this program is especially ideal for students who have varying interests or competing interests. What can you do with a major in pro music? And the answer is virtually anything. There is no set career path in pro music. Pro music majors go on to become active in all aspects of the music industry as performers, composers, arrangers, songwriters, producers, teachers. They work on both the commercial and creative sides. They work on stage as well as behind the scenes. So you can come to pro music with the clear idea of what you wanna be at the end of your four years here. And you can align your courses to build toward that goal or you can come into the program with not having a clear idea of what you wanna be and explore a combination of courses as you progress. Um, again, there's no one career path that, that, that this major leads to, uh, which is why I think it's one of the most popular majors at the school. And so with that, I think I'm out of time. So um, to find out more, I will say that you can just search professional music or pro music on the school's website. Uh, to, to see a, a little bit more of the basic information about the department. Um, and I'll end it here by saying that at Berkeley, we are very excited about the Korean presence and we welcome the talented students coming from Korea. We look forward to working with you, to supporting your musical studies and to providing you with rich musical and academic experiences so that you will be well prepared and well positioned to take advantage of the increasing opportunities in the global music industry today. Thank you. And with that, I will toss it back to Mr. Tim Lee.